Hi, I am so honored to have the opportunity to speak today, and I'm extremely grateful to everyone who's made this series happen. Um, like Dr. Messicker said, I'm here to talk about a parent's perspective of acute flaccid myelitis. My name is Rachel Scott. I'm a mom of five kids. I live outside Houston, Texas, and I'm currently speaking to you from uh, my office slash the therapy room. My son was diagnosed with AFM four years ago in July of 2016. And like so many parents who are suddenly faced with a rare life-changing diagnosis, we learned a lot very quickly. And I'm here to share a bit of that with you today. So Brayden was five in July of 2016. He had just finished preschool and was learning to read before kindergarten. He never stopped moving. He was always bouncing around and moving a million miles an hour. His favorite thing to do was to hop on one foot. For some reason, he was so proud of that. His story is very similar to the hundreds of stories of other kids with AFM, and I wish I could tell you all of them. He got a summer cold, just like all of my kids, and Braden didn't recover. On the 4th of July, he didn't want to swim when we went to a friend's house, so we let him stay home and rest. Later that evening at a barbecue, he threw up when he tried to eat a chip. Um, I put him in our friend's guest room and let him sleep while we did sparklers. We had to carry him to see the fireworks and he laid on our chest in the grass. Over the next few days, he still couldn't swallow anything and kept getting weaker. On the 6th of July, I finally carried him into the emergency room. They told me he had strep and mono, which seemed like a horrible diagnosis at the time. I remember thinking about how the recovery from mono would take months. Um, they pumped him full of fluids and steroids and antibiotics and told me he'd be better that evening. But he wasn't. He continued to decline, so we took him back in and we were admitted. And all this time, I attributed everything to what I believed was a sore throat. In my mind, he was weak because he wasn't eating, and he wasn't eating because his throat hurt. We never once entertained the possibility that perhaps his swallowing muscles were paralyzed and that paralysis was slowly spreading through his body. Um, on July 9th, the paralysis reached his diaphragm, and we were so fortunate that a nurse was already in his room and was able to quickly take care of him when he stopped breathing. What if it had been the middle of the night? What if the paralysis had spread faster and we were still at home when he stopped breathing? He was intubated and flown to a major hospital in Houston. Two days after we arrived in Houston, Braden finally got an MRI. It was only after a failed extubation attempt that they realized that something neurologic was happening. Um, Guillain-Barre and anterior horn cell disease were both diagnoses I remember being floated. But eventually, they pulled us into the little room and told us about acute flaccid myelitis. We had never heard of AFM. The doctors had never treated anyone with AFM. We had a million questions and no answers. Eight days after his first symptoms, we finally had the diagnosis and they started treatment. But what if we'd acted faster? What if our doctors were familiar with AFM and had it as part of their differential and got him treatment quicker? What if his legs were paralyzed first instead of his swallow? Would we have gotten a diagnosis quicker? Braden's paralysis spread everywhere except his left hand. He was left with the ability to do a few signs to communicate with us while he was intubated. Braden got IVIG and plasmapheresis, and we held out hope that maybe they would give us back enough that he could be extubated. They attempted extubation again and failed. 25 days in, they took him away for a trach and a G-tube. All our hope was crushed that he would bounce back and come home soon. But we were so grateful to be able to see his face again and hear little bits of his voice. He spent two months in the hospital before he was able to transfer to a rehab facility. The closest pediatric inpatient rehab facility that took kids on vents was in Dallas, five hours from home. So we shuttled kids back and forth to Dallas and took turns being there with Brayden. He had daily PT and OT and speech. We learned how to suction a trach, to change a trach, to disassemble and reassemble a vent, to run his tube feeds and administer his medications. We left rehab as amateur pulmonologists and therapists. We were experts at reading his x-rays and listening to his lung sounds. We learned so much. Braden spent five and a half months there, working as hard as a five-year-old can to recover, motivated primarily by playing his iPad. At discharge, he could take little steps with maximum assistance. He still had no ability to swallow and had to have the saliva suctioned from his mouth every few minutes. He was dependent on help for every aspect of his life. 
he was able to spend a few hours off the vent at a time and was still and was starting to begin to tolerate a PNV. His left arm was recovering and his right arm was still totally paralyzed. Braden had been gone for over seven months when he came home. I carried him out to the car in July and in February he came home in an ambulance. It still seems unfathomable to me. We converted our downstairs office into a mini ICU for him and learned how to reincorporate him into our lives. We had home nurses in our house 24 seven and nothing was the same. We carried on and did as much therapy as we could at home. We bought expensive equipment that was denied by insurance and kept him moving and going forward as much as we could. About 15 months post onset, we did a nerve transfer in LA. The transfer was um, moving the nerve for the right wrist extensor to hopefully give him the ability to do a pinch or grasp. We've seen a little return there and hope that it'll continue to improve as he grows. Since our initial discharge from rehab, we've traveled to Kennedy Krieger in Baltimore for six weeks of intense rehab and returned to Dallas for another month of rehab. We went to St. Louis for a nerve decompression to his femoral nerves to help increase the sig signals to his leg muscles. He had his trach removed in September, a little over three years into his recovery. One of the silver linings of everything being canceled right now means that we're doubling down on therapy at home. Our amazing home nurses get him on the treadmill and move him through exercises using electrical stimulation every single day. They have contributed immensely to his recovery and are invaluable to our family. Today, Braden can walk short distances independently. Some days he even walks home from school. He's been trach free for 10 months. After years of no progress with his swallow, it's finally returned a little bit. He manages all his oral secretions. He drinks sips of water and is somehow able to eat all the Chex Mix and Chick-fil-A nuggets he can get his hands on. Four years out, he keeps making progress and has shown no sign of plateauing. We're so proud of how willingly and how hard he works to be healthy. I could not be more proud of him. Sometimes I can't believe that we've been fighting this disease for four years. Next year, he'll have lived half his life as a quadriplegic. People like to tell me that it's a marathon and not a sprint, but I've run a dozen marathons. So from experience, I can tell you that they're wrong. This isn't a marathon because eventually marathons end and there's no end in sight for us. We're always looking for a new innovative therapy or new equipment for Braden to try. We've flown him coast to coast getting the help he needs. Our battle is unending. We're so desperate for more awareness and more research so that kids can be quickly and effectively treated. And I'm so grateful for all of you tuning in today to learn more about AFM. I wanna switch gears and tell you a little bit about the incredible community that we've become a part of. Back in 2016, AFM was still very far from being a household name. Googling didn't tell you much. I can still remember the exact feeling I had when I finally understood what AFM was. My sister's a surgeon and she had gotten in contact with a neurologist who treated a significant number of AFM kids and tried to learn more. I was sitting in the window of Braden's ICU room when my sister told me that many kids go home in wheelchairs, that they don't all walk out. Some kids need long-term ventilation, heartbreaking outcomes that I couldn't possibly wrap my head around. Last week, he was playing in a fire hydrant and learning to read. How is it possible that now he wouldn't be able to walk or breathe on his own? How would he go to kindergarten? In 2014, a few mothers of children with AFM found each other through the media. Those mothers formed a Facebook group to provide support to one another and to fight this rare diagnosis together. Over the past six years, the group has grown to over 800 members. It's a source of comfort to parents, a place they can vent and share their battles and victories, and it's become a source of information. Cases of AFM are so incredibly diverse, the level to which kids are affected and their recovery very wildly. No two cases are the same. Some kids are fully paralyzed and make little recovery. Some are impacted in just one limb and have no noticeable deficits. Some kids have their breathing impacted and require a ventilator and some don't. Even if a specialist or a neurologist has treated kids with AFM, it's still very unlikely they will have seen a child with the same set of paralysis and recovery. We learned about nerve transfers from each other. Many doctors weren't aware about these procedures four years ago, and we were pressing each other to investigate them and seek out the most skilled surgeons and get the nerve transfers before the window closed on recovery. And this is why the Facebook community has become so valuable to us. We all have the same unifying goal of rehabbing our paralyzed children. 
having parents who I can talk to about swallowing and vent weaning is huge. No one's quite like Brayden, but having other parents on the same road gives us so much practical help along with emotional support and cheerleading. You will never see so much excitement over a video of a quad muscle twitching like you will in our group. Beyond providing support to one another, our parents work hard to raise awareness. They contact the media, they share posts on Facebook, they participate in fundraisers. I'm amazed at how far our grassroots efforts have taken us. In 2018, uh, we traveled together to DC to meet with legislators and members of CDC. We traveled to Atlanta to share a perspective on CDC's AFM task force in early 2019. We formed a nonprofit, the Acute Flaccid Myelitis Association, to help provide further support to families and raise more awareness. The AFMA provides grants to help families support, support families um, affected by AFM. We're currently working to put together a children's book that will be available for families and providers to help explain AFM to kids in a language they'll understand. One of our parents who lost their son to AFM is currently working to request a unique and distinct ICD-10 diagnosis code to better address disease specificity that does not already exist in current ICD codes and subterms. A unique code will help to better support disease tracking, clinical care responses, and associated mortality rates. I am going to post a link in the chat section in a bit to a document that can be used as a starting point and an email address for the requests um, if you would like to uh, help support that. The value of awareness is so evident in the story of our buddy Corbin. Uh, a friend shared Braden's story early on and a girl named Elizabeth started following us all the way back in 2016. Fast forward to 2019, one day Elizabeth sent me a message. Her son was getting weaker and was in the hospital. Could it be AFM? And we walked through those next days and weeks together, and sure enough, it was AFM. Fortunately, we took everything I'd learned to help her advocate for Corbin. He was quickly diagnosed and got the treatment that allowed him to walk out of the hospital. Braden likes to remind me often that we saved Corbin and insists that I can't stop telling people about AFM. And I truly believe that awareness about AFM will save children in the coming months. It's critical that parents know that any sign of limb weakness following a cold must be taken seriously. I know I've yelled at my kids over the past few months that they are not allowed to break any bones because there's no way I'm walking into a hospital. But parents need to know that even in our current pandemic, limb weakness following a cold can be very serious. And clinicians need to know how to properly diagnose, treat, and report cases of AFM so we can learn more about this disease and how to save children from its heartbreaking effects. Thank you so much for giving me your time today. I am so grateful to Dr. Pardo and everyone who put this together. Um, I'm very much looking forward to the next speaker, Dr. Janelle Roth. When I met Dr. Roth at CDC, I was so touched by her very genuine desire to help our kids and her empathy for their stories. Epidemiology is a very hot topic currently, so I know everyone will enjoy and learn a great deal from her presentation. Thank you so much.